Well, most of us are now isolated, cooped up at home and struggling to find things to do that aren't eating or rotting away on the couch. That's basically been my experience so far. So to help out and to try to entertain you a bit, here are some scary stories to make your isolation creepy. If you have a story of your own, share it with us at darkstories.org. I'd love to hear stories about sea monsters or just being out at sea. Also, a quick question. What are you guys doing to entertain yourself during isolation? I might need some ideas. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Be sure to like this video if you support what I do. Ghosts of Firehouse 8 From Fire Medic 332 I'm an EMT and firefighter with 14 years of service. I could write volumes of books of things that I've seen so far. Some hilarious, some would make the hardest of you cry. But when it comes to the paranormal, I have a theory. I believe ghosts don't just haunt the place they died, they tend to haunt the first people they encounter. Perhaps it's something comforting to them to attach themselves to a living being at the time of their death. Our firehouse is especially haunted. It's nothing surprising to see doors open on their own, chairs moving along the floor, random objects being moved along tables, and phantom footsteps on all floors, sometimes in the very room we're in. We really became aware of how haunted the place was when we installed motion-activated lights and a CCTV security system. Lights would turn themselves on as if something would trigger the motion sensors, and the security cameras would catch figures moving around, as well as objects moving frequently. But this incident happened when I was just a rookie firefighter. I was cleaning our safety trailer one night. It's modeled after a single wide mobile home, and we use it at schools and special events to teach children and adults alike about fire safety and how to evacuate in case of emergencies. As I was cleaning the outside, I heard some children laughing just outside the firehouse. It was a hot summer day, and I had the bay doors open to let some cool air in. The laughter I heard was nothing particularly noticeable, or creepy, just sounded like two or three kids at play. A few moments later, I could hear them laughing inside of the main bay, where we keep our engine, rescue, and tanker trucks. I closed all but one bay door and made a thorough sweep of the building. I spoke in an assertive but non-threatening tone, informing the children that this was no place to play, that they could get in trouble, or worse, hurt themselves on our equipment. After searching the entire building, I could not find anything or anyone, and I figured they snuck out when I was in the back of the firehouse. So I closed the last bay door and resumed cleaning the safety trailer. Moments later, the door to the kitchen opened. This door has an industrial spring in one of the hinges, and it takes a good 7 to 10 pounds of pressure to open it. Just enough to where a gust of wind or a light breeze could not force it open. From inside, I could see my handheld radio, floating, rotating around as if someone was curiously looking at it. And again, I heard children laughing. This time, it was coming from the kitchen. I was standing on a small attic ladder, frozen in fear. I was the only living person in the firehouse at the time. It was a volunteer station, and it's not staffed 24-7 like a paid one. Suddenly, a chair started sliding in and out from under the kitchen table, but it suddenly stopped. Frozen in fear, I was still on the ladder, but only a few rungs up. To this day, this part gives me chills. I felt a very cold, still air on my legs, and from directly under the trailer, I could hear little whispers and faint giggling. As I finally gathered myself and climbed the ladder, I caught the smell of burnt, wet flesh. To put this smell into perspective, it's similar to the smell of burning meat on a grill and then dousing it with water. 
It's a smell you won't forget once you've responded to a fatal fire. Still hearing them giggling and whispering, I quickly ran out of the building and drove home, sweating, panting. I later called the chief and told him about what I experienced. He invited me to his home to explain what was happening. He explained to me it was the six-year anniversary of a fatal fire, a fire that claimed the lives of three small children, and they tend to frequently appear at the firehouse, especially on the anniversary of their deaths. What happened next nearly made me vomit. The chief played a video of the 15th anniversary of our fire department celebration and the delivery of our safety trailer. He paused the video and instructed me to listen very closely. As he played the video again, the camera moved around, and a couple was walking out of the station with their three small children. The children in the video were the same ones who sadly lost their lives six years before that very day, and their innocent laughter, and it was exactly the same as I'd heard around the firehouse. Red in the Dark, from J. Ion. I went out on an excursion into the hills and forests of Borneo with my teachers and schoolmates during the holidays in high school. For most of the trip, it was fantastic. The indigenous people were very warm and accommodating. The food and drinks we had were so unique yet delicious. The forests were pristine and beautiful. Wildlife magnificent and rare, the tropical paradise climate. I can go on and on about how amazing Borneo is. That was 99% of the trip. But there is the 1% of the trip that got me writing this. It was during a hike up a mountain on a national park. It was supposed to be a six-hour hike, and it soon became a 12-hour misadventure. We were meant to leave the camp after lunchtime and return by dinner. We started the hike one hour later than scheduled, because some students had wandered off on their own, and the teachers had to find them. When we finally did start hiking, some kids were significantly slower than the rest of us, so a few teachers had to slow down and watch over them. This in turn made our double line formation into single line formations that were intermittent with clusters of students and a teacher pushing them along. Unfortunately, the hike was a very challenging one. We had to climb over boulders, muddy paths, rotten leaves, and sometimes climb under fallen trees or through thick undergrowth. This slowed us down even more especially the teachers who had to cheerlead the slower students on, and occasionally convince a particularly squeamish child to just go under the moss-covered fallen tree that had vines hanging over the edge and happened to smell of rotten wood and felt slimy to the touch. When we did arrive at a clearing halfway up the mountain for rest, only half of us made it with our park ranger. We ended up waiting an hour for the other half of the group to join us, before being able to continue. By the time we were approaching the peak, the sun had started to set, and we had only arrived at the midway point of the hike. By then, we knew we would not make it back to the camp on time, as going up the mountain alone had taken all of the six hours that we originally designated for the entirety of the hike. Again, at the peak, we had to wait for the slower kids to catch up, and a small group of us ended up waiting in semi-darkness for half an hour before everyone was present and we proceeded. By the time we were descending the mountain, night started setting in. Our park ranger increased his speed, and those of us who could keep up matched his pace to cover the gap so that we could form a somewhat organized line to let those further behind know which way we would be heading by watching our lead. Regrettably, as I found out later on, no matter how well we tried to maintain that line formation, the darkness from the night meant that most people could not see in front of them, especially in the thick foliage of the Borneo jungle that made the brightest of days seem more subdued. Our park ranger was experienced in these group outings, 
So he and his colleagues had placed red tapes on trees as pathway guides if anybody got lost. MMO we remembered as it got more difficult to see. By the time we arrived at our halfway point in our descent, we stopped to rest and realized that three quarters of our group had been left way too far behind. They were so far behind that even when we tried making a light signal with our flashlights, no one responded. We then made a sound signal by clapping our hands and still got no response. So the handful of us that remained with the park ranger had to sit in total darkness in the middle of a forest, using the flashlights and our hands to make light and sound signals every five minutes. Almost an hour and a half later, finally we saw and heard responses. We tried being as loud as possible while flashing our lights in the direction of the responses so that they could get to our position. When they were finally with us again, we asked them what happened to make them so slow. The head teacher said that when she could not see the park ranger nor hear us, she followed his instruction to go along with the red tape on the trees. As it was so dark, she had to point her flashlight at trees to find the red tape, and she followed them whenever she saw them, with the students and other teachers in tow. They went down a path that led to a dead end. With such dense foliage, it was impossible for them to go through. She thought it odd, as she did exactly as the park ranger told her. So she decided to backtrack with the group until she came to an area where she could hear our sound signals. Then she followed the sounds until she saw us. Not thinking much of the experience, we proceeded to make our way back to camp. This time, me and two of my friends being senior to the other students and quicker on our feet, volunteered to be the last few people at the tail end of the group so that we could usher everyone ahead and ensure that no one got lost again. As we were getting nearer to the camp, the temperature dropped with each passing minute. I thought it was strange because Borneo was a tropical island. Even in the middle of the thick woods at night, the temperature rarely falls low enough for anyone to see their breath as they exhale, unless they were at the peak of a mountain, which we weren't because we were getting to lower ground. I was walking between my friends when the friend behind me asked to switch places, and I obliged. I noticed that my back felt like it was freezing, even though I was wearing my padded and waterproof backpack, but I didn't think too much of it and continued on. We came to a narrow path that had a section of three wooden steps. When it was my turn, I put my foot on the first step and decided to just skip the remaining steps by jumping onto the ground. Instead, I landed with my face on the ground and my limbs outstretched, like I had tripped or been pushed from a high place. The fall really hurt. My entire weight had fallen forwards onto the ground, and my flashlight broke when it hit the ground, causing a big bruise on my wrist too, as the rear end of the flashlight smashed into my forearm. But more than the pain was my surprise. I remember taking a small leap, and somehow I'm lying there flat on the ground. It was as if I completely lost consciousness for one second during my brief flight down those two steps. My friends turned back to help me up and walked with me between their arms as I was reeling from the pain and surprise. I surmised that I was clumsy and had slipped after a few minutes of thinking about it. When we were back at the camp having our very late dinner and providing first aid to anyone who needed it, I was getting my arm checked out when my friend sat in front of me and asked, Do you know why I asked to switch places with you in the woods? Because you didn't want to be the last person in the dark? I replied. Yeah, but also because I saw a woman in red several meters behind us in the trees. I was terrified. That's why I asked to switch. You are a terrible friend for putting me in a more dangerous position, I replied. When you fell, I knew something was wrong, she continued, because there's no way you could have fallen that way with that tiny height difference. You fell so hard like someone had pushed you. 
We could hear a loud sound as you hit the ground, too. I'm sorry, but I had to switch. If I had stayed behind, I would have just freaked out and told everyone. If someone was going to get hurt, and I think they were no matter what, would you have rather seen it coming? Fair point, I guess, I answered, as she apologetically helped me with compression and medication. For the rest of the trip, my friend was super nice to me, and even helped me with heavy loads because of the injury to my wrist. She even offered to buy me souvenirs, and became super protective of me when other students were trying to pick on me. But ever since her revelation about seeing a red woman in the dark forests of Borneo, I've developed a reactionary habit of becoming extremely alert whenever I see a flash of red anywhere near trees. The Time We Saw a Nightcrawler From The Quaker It was mid-September in 2014. I live in Visalia, California, and have been here for two years. I've made a good amount of friends. One September night, I was talking to one of them. We'll call them the Commodore. We were on the phone for a couple of minutes before they asked me to come over to watch some movies. I was on my way to his house to hang out around 7 p.m. Once there, we ordered a pizza and drank a couple of sodas, watching a Star Wars movie marathon, which obviously ran a little later than we expected. After Return of the Jedi ended, he turned off the TV. When I got up to stretch, it was around 1 a.m., give or take a few minutes. He asked me to throw away some of the garbage, so I went out back to throw away some of the empty soda bottles, along with the pizza box. As I was taking that out, I caught a glimpse of a white figure in the corner of my eye. I was startled and dropped one of the soda bottles. When I looked up, I didn't see anything. I passed it off as one of my friend's neighbors and went back inside. I questioned myself, asking why would anyone be outside at one in the morning. I went to the window to try and get a better look. I didn't see anything at first, but then, as I was turning away from the window, I saw a tall, slender being that appeared to be walking around on two legs. It slowly moved across my friend's backyard, eerily taking step after step with unnaturally long legs. It had no suggestions of a body above the legs either, and there was a spherical shape on top, which I can only assume is the head. Though I could barely see any facial features, I couldn't believe what I was seeing and tried rubbing my eyes to see if what was in front of me was really there. After realizing that the figure was 100% real, I ran to my friend in a panic. He asked me what was going on, and before he could finish his sentence, I dragged him to the window. I watched as his jaw dropped, seeing the figure. He started to freak out too, so I thought to turn off the lights and duck down. I was afraid to stay in the area, so I asked my friend if he'd rather sleep at my place. He took me up on the offer, and we drove to my house and went to bed, though neither of us could actually fall asleep. That next morning, we tried researching what it was. It took us a while, but after finding numerous videos and pictures of things called the Fresno Nightcrawlers, we thought that's what we had seen. Compared to them, they were of similar shape. There have been a couple of other sightings of these strange creatures around the state. After reading up more and more about creatures similar to this thing in mythology and folklore, I believe they may be ancient beings first discovered by Native Americans. I've shared this story a number of times with friends and family, but not all of them believe us. We know what we saw that night, and I've never seen anything like it before or since. Apartment 408 From Kit Kat Rearia I live in central Alberta, and the apartment I live in is known by many, including previous landlords, to be very haunted. I've been here for almost three years, and the only deaths in the building were all on the fourth floor, 
first one was a drug OD. The first spring back in 2018. The second was an elderly man I grew fond of who passed away in February due to being ill from the condition of his apartment. And finally, the senior in 408, roughly two weeks ago. Somehow, no one knew he lived there, not even the landlord. He was so sick all the time he never left his place. He had been deceased for a few days before his body was discovered, and the only reason it was found before summer was because another cold spill hit, so the landlord had to turn up the heat in the building. The AC had kept the decomposing smell contained to his apartment. The police, medics, fire department, etc. came and left in a matter of hours. Of course, an investigation had to be done before the body could be removed. It was a sad moment for sure, but we all got on with life as this had become the norm here. Since the man in 408 had passed, weird things began to happen, and I mean more than usual. My friend on the fourth floor is friends with 408's neighbor, who recently got a girlfriend, and she kept mentioning that she was scared to sleep over, as she had an uneasy feeling about the place. But since her man was in rehab from Monday through Friday, she said she had no choice but to suck it up and keep an eye on the place. There's only four floors in these three apartment buildings, which is one big complex owned by the same company. The elevators started having issues on the fourth floor. You can go up to the fourth floor, but going back down is tricky. You literally have to wait for someone either on the main, second, or third floor to hit the elevator button before it goes back down. A few times this happened to me. It only began happening after the man passed. I would be stuck in the elevator between three to nine minutes or so before the door would open to let me out. But it gets stranger. Multiple people, including myself, in the past week have noticed things such as brooms, pictures, etc. being knocked over multiple times. The first night it happened, I assumed it was one of my cats, who was famous for climbing onto the shelves in the laundry room and knocking over things. So, growing frustrated after the fourth time things fell off the shelf, I put the cat in the kennel after scolding it. I turned in for the night after that. Both cats were with me in my room, and it happened again. This time it was only my daughter's pool noodle and the broom. Now I knew something was up. I tried to dismiss it as the building shifting or something logical like that, so I could get some sleep. But after returning to bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. It was so strong that every time I looked into the hallway, I expected to see someone standing in my doorway, staring at me. Thankfully, I never did. The next morning, I went up to my friends for coffee and breakfast. She was explaining that her freezer door kept opening, and things like the frozen bag of peas or her stash of chocolate bars would fall out and hit the floor. Then she paused and turned to me, asking, By the way, why were you sneaking around my apartment so late at night? I was dumbfounded. I'd been in bed all night. What do you mean, I ask? My friend didn't look impressed. Dude, I'm not in the mood to joke right now. I freaking watched you walk past my door and down the hall. It was dark, but the light from the TV was bright enough that I could make out a figure. And it was tall like you, all in black like you dress, just in general had your body shape, even your slouch. She explained to me, sounding very tired and very annoyed with me. I assured her that I was too busy being the chicken I am and hiding in my bed all night. She looked horrified at this. But I swear, it looked just like you, she mumbled. Not much has happened since that night a week ago, other than a few things here and a few things there but I'm still a little scared to fall asleep at night, with these, anyway. Skinwalker, from M. Miller, 96. Yeah, I know it's a topic you've done a million times, 
but I wanted to share my story with you. First, I feel as though I need to give some background on myself. I was raised by my mother, who was 50% Cherokee and 50% French. Us kids have never met our biological grandpa. She believes in the paranormal, but tries to pretend it isn't there. My father, who is Scottish and English, German and Jewish by blood, on the other hand, is 100% atheist and is rather skeptical about things he can't explain. He endeavors to be a logical and scientific person in all things. Well, due to the major differences in personalities, beliefs, and values, they ended up being divorced when I was eight. My mother soon married my stepfather, who was a devout Southern Baptist from Mississippi, and basically gave up her identity as a native and became a God-fearing woman. Despite issues with my mother, my dad continued to let us visit with her mom and stepdad because he felt that they were good people. They taught us many things about native culture, spirituality, legends, and their people. My grandmother and I spent a lot of time together, so I was given an ample opportunity to learn Cherokee medicine. My grandma comes from a long line of medicine men slash women and is one herself. Now, so many years later, at the ripe old age of 23, I am one myself. So now you have some insight. Now, this isn't a ghost story, but I do believe it qualifies as paranormal, as it is outside usual daily happenings. About two years ago, my father, brother, and I moved into a new home a little more in the country than our previous homes had been, something we thoroughly enjoyed because we grew up immersed in nature and a love for the land. Shortly after moving there, about three months in, I decided it was time to expand the family by getting myself a puppy. This would be the first dog that would actually be in my care. I've always had a very strong connection to dogs as my guiding spirit is a wolf. I learned this on a vision quest many years ago. After a while of searching, I came across a beautiful five-month-old male German Shepherd pit bull mix. I went to meet him and instantly fell in love. He was the greatest, very sweet, kind to the cats, and protective of me. He became my best friend, everything you could want in a dog. Now, anyone who has owned a puppy or young dog will know potty training is a task. Even after being with us two months, he was still waking me up every two to four hours to go out. Hard on the circadian rhythm, but it had to be done. On one occasion in particular, we got a late night visitor we were not expecting. Like I said, my dog woke me up in the night. This time it was around 2.45 a.m. and I wasn't ready, but I dragged myself out of bed and clicked on the leash. Opening the back door greeted me with a cold breeze. I rolled my eyes and went out into the yard with my pooch. He did the usual dog thing, sniffing around and jumping in the freshly cut grass, completely forgetting what we'd come outside to do in the first place. I whistled at him, recapturing his attention, so he got back to business. As he squatted, I turned my head to the sky, offering him some privacy. The moon was exceptionally large that night, almost full but not quite. During this observation, I began to realize there was no typical nighttime noise around me. As if that wasn't unusual enough, I had a shiver go down my spine, and my arm hair began to stand on end. That's when I heard my dog let out a low growl. He pinned himself against my legs. When I looked down at him, his tail was tucked, and hackles were raised. When I tried to move, he pressed himself against me more. Another shiver came over me, and then I took the opportunity to follow where his eyes were looking. When I did, I was looking at what appeared to be a coyote, not totally uncommon in the area. We'd heard them on many nights living here, but this was different, looked different, and felt different. The most frightening thing, however, was that it was looking right back at me. I didn't move, didn't take my eyes off of it, that's how I was able to see its features so clearly in the moonlight. Its fur looked thin, even bald in some spots. Its eyes were yellow, not reflective yellow, like you'd see on a dog in the dark, but yellow like the sun, powerful, almost blinding. 
Then, looking more closely, I noticed its back legs were longer than a normal coyote. Longer than any canine creature should be, actually. Starting at the hips and going down, they seemed to look almost bipedal in design. That's when it dawned on me just what I was seeing. I picked up my 60 pounds dog, never taking my eyes off the creature. As I did, I said a Cherokee prayer in my head that I'd learned from my grandma. As if it was physically upset, it backed up slightly, and then I heard a voice that perfectly mimicked my grandma's say, Why would you do that, Mickers? That's M-I-K-K-E-R-S, by the way. No one aside from my grandparents ever called me that. It was their special name for me. With that, I darted for the door. Dog still in my arms, I entered, put him down, and locked the door behind me. The noise must have woke up my brother, because he came into the kitchen all bothered. He asked me what was going on and why the dog was all riled up. I held my finger to my mouth and shut off the light. We then made our way into the living room and shut that light off as well. And like something out of a horror movie, the outline of a tall humanoid thing was shown through the stained glass of the small window on the door, outlined by the bright moonlight. We both froze, and he made a grab for the doorknob when it began to turn. He caught it just in time to lock it, that's when it spoke to him, too, but this time in my grandpa's voice. Bubba, why don't you let grandpa in? They live on a reservation in Cherokee, North Carolina. His face turned ghost white, and he turned to me. That's when I mouthed the word, and he paled even more. The thing began to tap on the glass, and we both went into my room, ignoring the sound. The following night, around the same time, the tapping came again and grew louder. We sat in the living room, praying to Yune La Nui, the Cherokee sun goddess, also called the Great Spirit. We prayed that it would go away. The tapping turned into knocking, which turned into pounding the more we prayed. This must have woke up my father, because he ran downstairs in a huff. We told him about the night prior during the day, but he didn't believe us and thought it was just one of my brother's friends being a jerk. So when he saw the silhouette in the window, he grew more angry. He made a beeline for the door to open it. We yelled at him not to open it, but he didn't listen. He threw that door wide open. The creature, instead of harming him, seemed to be afraid. It got down on all fours and disappeared down the road, but my dad had seen enough. His face went pale. He stumbled backward a few steps. He locked the door behind him, and we all went to bed. The next day, we talked about the situation. I explained to him the natives called the creature a skinwalker. They aren't very common in Cherokee legend. They're more of a western native legend, but my grandparents still taught us about them. Dad, being the skeptic, just summed it up to a weird thing he couldn't explain. Later that day, I went to our local craft store and bought juniper ash, as my grandma instructed, and I sprinkled it around the house. It never returned, but my dog was never the same after that night. It's as though the entire experience changed him. He went from a loving animal to a mean and unpredictable one. He began lashing out at anyone who wasn't female. We tried correcting it over the course of a year and a half, but nothing helped. When he finally harmed my brother, causing him to bleed, I was forced to find him a new home. Luckily, he's with a couple, who are both female, and he seems much happier. But even to this day, I guarantee he won't go out at night. I didn't mention the name of the creature many times, because it is considered a bad omen in native culture to give those things energy. I'm going to link this story in the description, as the author has ended their story with a guide on how to protect yourself if you're nervous about these entities. So if you're tuning in on YouTube, or on Patreon, I'll have the link in the description. 
but if you're on a different platform, I won't be linking it. Instead, you can go to my website, darkstories.org. Click the search button in the menu. Make sure topics is selected for what you're searching. Then type in two words, skin walker. You're looking for the post by M. Miller 96. Well, that brings us to the end of today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. More scary stories are coming out soon, so stay tuned. If you want your story narrated on the show, all you gotta do is share it with us at darkstories.org. Any stories are accepted at any time, as long as they're creepy and allegedly true. But at the moment, I am specifically looking for sea monster sightings and out-at-sea stories. Check the links in the description if you want to support the show. Now then, here are the credits to my all-time patrons. They're pretty great. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.